Um, my name is Chris Alexander with the Saratoga Springs Public Library. We're delighted um, to be co-hosting with the Southern Adirondack Audubon Society Time to Fly program with the bird diva, Bridget Butler. And we're recording this program in speaker views and we will put this on the library's YouTube channel. And once it's up there, I'll send all of you who have registered a link. At this point, I wanna turn it over to John Lowe's, who's the president of the Southern Adirondack Audubon Society to make his announcements and introduce um, our speaker. Over to you, John. All right, thank you, Chris. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's been uh, uh, one heck of a pandemic. I don't know what to say at the beginning of some of these <laughs> Zoom programs, but um, the, the light is at the end of the tunnel and um, uh, some of our libraries are considering and are opening up 50% and hopefully their community rooms will be opened up 50% by next year, uh, if not more, so we can start having these programs in person again. Uh, we love the communal part of gathering together to talk about what we've seen in nature and to enjoy uh, seeing speakers and programs together. So I am really looking forward to that. I know a lot of you out there are too. But we've been able to really meet a lot of people from out of town, out of state, who've been able to enjoy our programs. Uh, it's really great to see uh, a person from Ridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, tuning in and those from Vermont tuning in. And I've been so excited to finally get Bridget Butler, the Dirt Bird Diva to uh, be come to our chapter if through the interwebs for right now. And then next year we'll have her hopefully in person during Women's History Month for a program on uh, bird, women ornithologists and uh, female birds. And then later in the spring to have an in-person bird walk here in our area. Yes, let's make sure that happens. So I am so excited to have um, Bridget here, but just a couple announcements works. Our chapter is excited. Uh, we have upgraded our website and we will be releasing it in another week or two. It's been a long time coming to finally upgrade the website and to uh, make it easier for you, for you to become a chapter supporter, as well as make a donation, as well as being able to give a gift membership. So in another week or two, we're going to launch that. Please keep checking in to southernadirondackaudubon.org to check it out. And we will continue to make many upgrades as we go uh, over the next couple of months. But in another week, uh, the next thing, we are starting our in-person bird walks again, starting on Saturday, November 6th, starting at 8 a.m. at the Spring Run Trail in Saratoga Springs. The parking lot is near the corner of East and Excelsior uh, Avenues. And so we're looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, we're also going to hopefully have a raptor a uh, winter raptor walk, which is more of a drive through the Fort Edward grasslands in the wintertime, January, probably early February. So keep a look on our website and our Facebook page about that. We're really excited to do that, um, led by the Grassland Bird Trust, our, our very good partners in protecting that important bird area. Uh, let's see, membership. Yes, I did mention membership. If you do like what if you like what you're watching tonight and like what we're doing, you can check our last newsletter and the newsletter before to see what kinds of conservation projects and education programs we've been supporting and doing. We rely on you. We rely on your chapter support. We rely on your donations to keep this thing going. We're a 37 year old chapter. Uh, we're looking forward to forward to our 40th anniversary and hopefully it will all be in person and I think that's about it I don't want to hold up any longer because I'm excited to hear about fall migration and beyond let's let me introduce quickly Bridget 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Bridget Butler. I'm also known as the Bird Diva. Um, I live in uh, northwestern Vermont in the land of the Abenaki people along the Missisquoi River. And I am um, a mom. I have three kids, uh, 10, 9, and 8. Um, and I have a small business called Bird Diva Consulting, where I do outreach and um, services, guide services, landowner services, all focused around birds and bird conservation. Um, I have worked for Audubon, Vermont, Audubon, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts Audubon, Maine Audubon. Uh, I think that's all the Audubon, so throughout New England. Um, I've had a number of jobs with different conservation organizations working with landowners on protecting forests and waterways as well. Um, you can find a lot of my work at birddiva.com if you're interested in learning a little bit more. So tonight I'm here to share with you kind of this shift in seasons and talk a little bit um, about migration. Um, I do have the chat box open. Feel free to drop questions in there as we go. Um, what we're going to try to do is um, answer them toward the end. We'll make sure we have a little bit of time to spend together um, discussing some of your questions. And guess what? There's a lot of expertise in the audience out here. All of you um, have knowledge that you can share as well. So when those questions um, pop up, if you've got inside knowledge, you can share it as well. And I would love to hear from you about your experiences. All right, so here we go. This is what we're gonna, we're gonna get underway here. So here's what you can expect from our time together tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these different subsets of birds that are moving during this time of year. We're gonna talk a little bit about migration in and of itself and why it's so crazy unique and why we're still studying it because we, we still don't totally understand how it all works. Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to share a couple of studies um, from locally from Vermont on some of the migration patterns of birds. And then um, to wrap up, I'll talk a little bit about what we can do as community members to kind of think about um, what steps we can take to help birds that are migrating and on the move um, during the spring and the fall. All right. So here we are. I don't know about you, but today was pretty gorgeous in terms of fall weather. And yesterday was kind of mm, that drizzly, rainy fall day. Um, and sometimes I think I look back and I really want summer back again. And I miss some of the, the frenzy of the nesting season and baby bird season, like the little uh, juvenile robin here on the side. But I really appreciate this quiet, contemplative period of time before we get into winter. Um, it seems like everything slows down, but really, there are some things happening that if we just slow down a little bit, we can look and listen a bit more carefully and we can still find glimpses of some of our feathered friends that have maybe already started to move on and maybe they're still sticking around. So how do these birds really know when to move, right? We have sets of birds that are leaving this area to go find places where they will find better resources, things more plentiful food resources during this time of year. Scientists aren't completely sure, but there's a lot of different research that's happening and really you have to keep up with it each year because our technology is advancing in a way that is allowing us to answer some more of these questions. But what we think right now is that migration is really triggered by a combination of different changes. So we can think of them as changes in day length, um, changes in temperature, changes in food supply. And then there's also this internal genetic predisposition for birds to migrate. The main core thing is really that birds need to move from places of depleted resources as we move out of this season of where there's like seeds and berries that are plentiful and insects hatching across the land. The temperatures get colder and those resources tend to shrink. 
So they're going to move someplace where they can find more um, plentiful resources. This is a great little kind of way to think about, like a visual to think about what birds are doing at different times of year. And one of the things that's really wonderful, one of the resources that we have available to us online is the resource from Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is Birds of the World. And you can actually find a very similar type of diagram for each species of bird on that bird's profile. So if you start to get into trying to understand individual species and when they are going to be moving and when they are going to be arriving back, that can be a really great resource to kind of tap into that deeper knowledge you want to know about a species um, that might be right in your backyard. This is one of my favorite words when it comes to migration, Suk und Ruhe. So it's a German word, which means migratory restlessness. Mm. And maybe sometimes we feel a little bit of restlessness during these times of year. Zug means move, und Ruhe is anxiety. And we put those two together and we've got this kind of way to describe some of the changes that affect the bodies of birds, right? It's physiological. So things like the amount of fat that they're carrying. Um, molting is another piece, right? So a lot of these adult birds, as they finish fledging their young for the year, they're going to molt. They're going to need these new feathers so that they can make these long distance flights. And hormones are shifting and changing. So what we see in some birds is they start to display an increased activity at dusk. And I bet it, you've probably noticed this with different birds around you. It breaks their normal sleep pattern up and is a cue to them that this is the time of year to migrate, whether it's long distance or short distance or just migrating um, and moving in response to food as well. The other thing that happens during this time of year in response to this feeling of migratory restlessness is something we call hyperphagia, right? So this is when birds are just eating and eating and eating and eating. I love this slide because I've got, a, you know, four different species of birds here that are all feeding on different types of native plants, right? So we have um, Virginia creeper up there in the corner with the upside down warbler. We've got gray cat bird, um, probably chomping down. That looks like dogwood. Um, we've got a thrush down on the bottom that is, maybe that's a winterberry. I love winterberries and they are persistent through the whole winter, which is great. And then hummingbird there in the jewelweed or touch me not, which is a really great plant to keep in your yard or in your neighborhood during this time of year as the hummingbirds are starting to leave. So what birds need to do during this time of year is really bulk up. They need to increase their weight by up to 50% in order to make some of these long distance flights. So they're also eating a great deal before migration starts, but then during the stopovers. So if we even start to think of our own backyards as these little buffets for stopping over during travel, we could do a little bit better job of providing some great food sources by them for them by tapping into the native plants that are around us. So I really like viburnums and dogwoods. Those are the two that I like to make sure I have in my yard. Um, Virginia creeper, I keep um, taking little cuttings and trying to start those so that I have some Virginia creeper kind of working over the fences. Um, we leave the jewel weed alone in my backyard as well. Um, and then there's other types of plants. Winterberry was another one I mentioned. Sumac is a great one as well. So what the birds are getting from these, there's lipids and sugars from these berries um, and flowers that really help the birds bulk up and have the energy that they need to be able to endure during migration. Now, if we think about this in people terms, this is really kind of crazy. So get this, 175 pound man who wants to gain 105 pounds, that's 60% of their body weight, right? In two weeks would have to eat 46 Big Macs per day for 14 days. I don't know. I can't even eat a big, I don't, yeah. I, I always feel bad after I eat McDonald's. I want to eat it. it. It tastes really good in the moment and then it tastes horrible and then it's horrible after. So if I even had to eat like two,
too big, Max. I don't think I could make it, but that's a lot, right? So we need to have places on the land where these birds can rest, take shelter, and refuel. So that's why this movement to really think about keeping native plants on the landscape and not planting things that are, are um, invasive or will outcompete those plants is really important. Awesome. Hyperphagia. Don't try that tomorrow. Don't, don't try that at home. All right, let's talk a little bit about the different types of migration because you're probably thinking, well, there's some birds that are sticking around, so not everybody's leaving, right? So we can actually break it down into a couple of different categories, right? So we have um, permanent residents here in the Northeast. So these are the birds that don't migrate. They're um, adapted to the cold temperatures and they're able to find adequate supplies of food year round. A lot of people ask me about bird feeders and whether or not bird feeders interrupt um, birds' ability or makes them too dependent um, on the feeders that we put out during the winter time. And actually, the circuit that birds do, feeder birds do, um, they are only really using about 25% of their daily diet at your feeder, right? Which is why it's not good to like forget to fill up your feeders and things like that. So we really want to make sure, again, that we can keep those native plants on the land because native plants also have native insects, which are going to hide in those little crevices and places that are going to be great for some of our permanent residents like chickadees. All right, then we have birds that are short distance migrants and short distance migrants like this dark eyed junco here, they move well, short distances. In the case of the junco, they move from higher elevations to lower elevations. And someone in the chat, I should scroll back up and be like, where's the person that said the juncos came back and there it is. Elizabeth was talking about our first little juncos arrived. I noticed that in my neighborhood too this week, right? So these are these little changes that we can start to notice and be like, oh, there, that's my short distance migrant. All right. Medium distance migrants like blue jays. So these guys will cover distances that span from one to several states in response to food. You've probably noticed the blue jays flocking up. There's like teams of them kind of they're they're so noisy in our neighborhood right now. I feel like it's like crows and jays are like stealing the show right now in terms of the soundscape and and like physical presence in my neighborhood. So those those blue jays are going to be mini, medium distance migrants. They're going to move in response to food and they start to flock up during this time of year. So it's easier for them to find food together, right? Many eyes make it much easier to find food sources. Then we have long distance migrants like this black Bernian warbler. These typically move from their breeding ranges in the United States and Canada to wintering grounds in Central and South America. And um, some of them um, fly like super uber long distance. Like I think of like all the way to Argentina and we're gonna talk about some of those birds a little bit later. So it's really kind of interesting how we can start to pay attention to the movement and shifting of different birds. So Martha says, she's got a question. There are a lot of robins eating at the neighbor's winterberry every day. Do some of the robins stay here in New England during the winter? Yes. And so what we think of as our breeding robins that were here during the breeding season are probably not the same robins. They may or may not be, but we're going to have other robins kind of shift and move into um, this place. So they may be our summer robins and they may be robins from different places in New England. So I would call them somewhere between like a short and middle distance migrant. Good, good, good. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the routes that they take. And I'm going to come back to this again because I think it's really kind of interesting how we've been able to um, complete some studies that really show us exactly how birds are, are moving. 
Um, but what we've discovered actually from some of the research that's been done by Cornell, so this comes from the Journal of Biogeography from 2014, most of our work when it comes to understanding where birds migrate, like the pathway that they use, right? The flyways comes from studies on waterfowl, right? We have a lot of information from hunters and conservation organizations um, that are protecting um, wetlands and different habitats for waterfowl about what waterfowl flyways are like, but we didn't really have a good understanding of songbirds until now. And part of that is because of the technology that we can use to track birds, but then it's also stuff like eBird that helps us kind of figure out the patterns for when birds are moving and, and how they're moving across the landscape. So this study actually revealed that birds are using elliptical routes that take advantage of prevailing wind patterns to save calories, right? So if you are keyed into the weather, you can use these pathways and then you don't have to, you're not going to use as much of your reserves, which is really great. So what they found in this study is there's actually three different songbird flyways that they've been able to identify, a Western group, a central group, um, and an Eastern group. And they kept the turn flyway and, and held on to that from waterfowl research to kind of be able to tap into to, to the connection that people have between those two. But they noted that these flyways for songbirds are much more spread out across the continent and routes in the central part and the eastern part overlap considerably, which is why sometimes we get really unique migrants in our, in our region um, that don't seem like they should be here. So the other thing that this really um, revealed is that more land birds than they realized previously follow different routes in the spring and the fall. And we're gonna see that in a little bit in some of the slides I'm gonna share from some of the research um, in Vermont. All right. Here is another awesome study. I love all these maps. We're gonna do a lot of maps. If you like maps, I like maps. We're gonna do some map stuff here. So this is a graphic by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it's um, kind of showing data from this uh, study that was published in Nature and Ecology and Evolution in September of 2018. And what they discovered is that each autumn, an average of 4 billion, billion, that's with a B, 4 billion birds move south from Canada into the U.S., at the same time, another 4.7 billion birds leave the United States over the southern border heading to the tropics. And what's crazy is in the spring, it's a little bit less. Look at those numbers. 3.5 billion birds cross back into the U.S. from points south and 2.6 billion birds return to Canada across the U.S. border. In other words, we've got fewer birds returning to their breeding grounds after going through fall migration and spending months on their wintering grounds. And here's what was even more surprising. I think this is really super cool. They found that birds wintering in the tropics survive the winter better than birds wintering in the United States. And the reason for this, they theorized, is that in the United States, there are greater habitat disturbances and maybe more buildings to crash into. It may also be a function of the fact that shorter distance migrants tend to have a higher reproduction rate to offset mortality. So it's really kind of fascinating to start to look at and think about right now, how many billions of birds are flying overhead. It's really incredible. And a lot of this is happening right now at night. Many of the birds fly at night because it's cooler on their body. It's a little bit easier for them um, to maintain a, a, an even body heat, not get overheated or stressed in that way. And they're also migrating in part by the stars. So let's talk about how we can key into that. I hope some of you know about this already. This is a really cool feature that Cornell um, it has available. You can get an email sent to you. Um, and what they do is they basically update you with different migration forecasts. Now, back in the day, we used to use weather radar. I don't know how many of you 
have done that before. I can't see you, but you could raise your hand in the chat where you went online and you learned how to read weather radar and all the signatures for it, the right colors and everything, because we can actually pick up these birds lifting off of the land and into the sky at night. So we're looking at nighttime weather radar for these certain color signatures it's typically blues and greens that will show that they it's not rain it's not precipitation it's birds but now cornell what cornell has done is they've kind of put it all together for us we don't have to do it anymore <laughs> figure it out on our own um and they produce um these updates which is really great so they'll give you like the night of september 19th through the 20th 2018 and they'll tell you whether or not your region is going to be hot for migration or cool so they can um track um when birds are going to um be um peak in the in that region and then that allows us as birders to go out the next morning and take advantage of the birds that might be coming down to rest and refuel. So these models that they're using now come from um, the last 23 years of bird movements that they have looked at um, using NEXRAD weather surveillance radar. And now they're able to predict when birds are going to be moving as well, almost right down to the species, which is pretty incredible. So here's another one of the maps that you can um, tap into. And this one, um, you can get it to, um, to kind of um, show you like the live, um, the live stream of when they're moving. I like to look at this the next morning to like look at the direction of flow. Um, so you'll see these little, um, the green dots on here are where there are radar stations. We have one main one in Vermont. I think it's actually up near where I live. I'm pretty sure in St. Albans. Um, and they're showing the direction that um, the, the birds are moving. So you can hit play. I can't do that on this slide because I didn't make it live, but it allows you um, to be able to watch in your area when birds might be in flight. So Jason says, yes, I have used weather, weather radar use. Yes, I have used weather radar for sure. How do birds use stars? How do we know that? I don't think we know that for sure yet. I think there's some different studies out there. I remember this one that was called the Emlyn, Emlyn Funnel, where um, they did this experiment where they put the birds in a dark room and then they exposed them um, outdoors to the stars and the birds hopped around in this strange funnel and they got to figure out which direction they went in. I'll have to look that up and maybe I can send it to, um, I'm writing it down. Um, I can send it to John and he can post it. We can even post it in the comments on the YouTube video. Um, but really, Jason, like all of this is still being teased apart and we're still trying to figure out um, how birds actually do this because it's really kind of amazing and how birds get off track as well. All right, so let's talk about, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what happens when they come down. When you come down for the day, right, you're in a totally new and different spot you might not know where all the hot food sources are, where the good berries are, where the trees with the good bird uh, bugs are. It may be a completely different habitat to you. So in a lot of these places, those resident birds that um, are there year round are the birds that are going to be kind of the ambassadors. And these are the birds that I pay attention to during fall migration, because those are the birds that are going to kind of be in these little mixed flocks with the warblers and the vireos um, and, and some of the other birds that we're, we're excited about seeing. So chickadees and tufted titmice are those ambassadors for us in our region. And a lot of my bird mentors always said to me, both during spring and fall migration, pay attention to the chickadees. Where there are chickadees during those migration times, that's where you're going to have other birds because these birds know where the food sources are and they move through the forest like at ease. And so the warblers kind of start to mix in with them. All right. I bet a bunch of you are into warblers, right? Okay. How about hawks mm -hmm. and waterfowl? 
shorebirds. Oh my gosh, shorebirds, right? And I feel like we're moving out of shorebird season and into waterfowl season. Well, let's go back and enjoy some of the warbler stuff. And we're going to talk through most of those groups of birds here. So what I love about fall migration is um, it's a whole other level of challenge, right? So we have birds that are either molting, coming out of their adult plumage, getting new feathers in. We have juveniles that are either still in their juvenile plumage or like just starting with a little bit of a mashup of adults, right? Or they're not going to change at all. And it's different for every species. So for a long time in the birding community, we call fall warblers confusing. And I just want to just break that up and say, let's not think of it that way. Let's think of it as a really fun challenge. So this time period tends to be right. We have some warblers that are starting to migrate at the end of August. And then as we get into September and the first maybe week or so of October, October, see now I'm putting up months and warbler together. So during October, oh, October, um, we have some of the um, trailing warblers coming through. Um, some folks on here were talking about palm warblers still being in their region in Vermont. So we've got like a period of time to really enjoy warblers. And what's great is after we do that, then we've got other birds that we can kind of fit into the mix as we move through fall and head into winter. So these little guys will drop down, guys and gals will drop down during the day to rest and feed. They want to avoid hawks mainly. So they are doing a lot of their movement at night and not during the day. And so you may get a chance to see birds that aren't breeding in Vermont or New York. So here we have common yellowthroat and um, magnolia warbler. And they can look really different in the fall, right? We can have juveniles. Um, that don't quite have that adult plumage in yet. So it's a little bit more of a challenge um, and fun to kind of test yourself at how different they can look. So this common yellow throat here is, on the left is gonna head to the Eastern Caribbean. The Magnolia Warbler on the right is um, gonna go to the Caribbean, Central America, and it actually crosses the Gulf to get there, which is really kind of incredible to think about flying out over, oops, open water for a long period of time as a really teeny tiny, I mean, these are smaller than chickadees in some cases. And then we have these guys, right? Like the end all be all of the confusing, sorry, challenging warblers, right? For the fall. We have um, bay-breasted warbler here on the left and black pole warbler, like, which is like a fake chickadee on the right, okay? And then we have their, their other, whoops, molts here, right? So we have the bay breasted down below and like completely different birds. So we can fine tune our eye and watch for those migration patterns using BirdCast to be present when these birds pop up. So let's see, black uh, bay breasted warbler is Panama, Northern Colombia, and Venezuela. And then the black pole warbler, that one there on the right, we are gonna come back to this one because there's some really cool research that's been done on this bird. This is the longest migration of any warbler. This bird does a total of 5,000 miles to South America and they need to double their body mass to do so. So where before we were talking about like putting on 50%, we got to like just double it up, just pack it on and, and keep going. That's a lot of insects. Some warblers will even shift to eating berries, right? So their diet will change based on what they need during different times of year. So that's another really kind of cool thing to watch for. Is that bird eating berries now? Has it shifted its feeding behavior to meet the needs for migration? All right, some of you I know like hawks. I don't know, where's the good hawk? Maybe somebody could put this in the chat. Where is a good hawk migration site in the Southern Adirondacks? That might be cool. Here in Vermont, we go to Putney Mountain, Putney Mountain in Southern New Hampshire, or Southern Vermont, geez. Or we go to Mount Philo, which is um, just outside of Burlington. So here's a welcome pain in the neck, 
right? We get to kind of gaze at hawks as they're migrating overhead, which really means we have to shift the way that we look at these birds, which I love because what it does is it pushes us to really start to look at silhouettes here. So if you've um, played around with bird silhouettes, we can really get an idea of these unchanging characteristics. And I think that's like a big thing we get hung up on. We really want to focus on plumage. And one of the core things that we can practice is kind of blocking out plumage to start with and really looking at shape and then proportions, right? So how much does the head lead out from that leading edge of the wings? What's the shape of the tail like and what's the length like in relation to the length of the body? How broad or narrow are the wings? Or in the case of the peregrine falcon down below there, um, narrow and pointed, right? So we put that right in um, the falcon family. Jason, thank you. Thatcher State Park is a good spot, Jason says for migrating hawks in southern um the southern southern adirondacks in new york and what we're looking for is a place where we have like a little bit of a hill or a mountain right and we have these nice warm fall days that warm up throughout the day so what they do is they create what we call an updraft and that updraft then provides this thermal that the birds can ride on, right? So we can ride the updraft up and then we can ride the thermal even higher. And what we get is something called um, a kettle. So bird, the hawks will be kettling together and spiraling upwards. That's why there's that really nice spiral in the orange arrow. So it's a really cool thing that you can look for um, in the sky, right? And notice all these birds kind of moving together in a column upwards. And as they hit the cooler air up at the top, what they do is they spill off the top and they head toward to the south and just keep kind of flying that way and catch the next thermal and rise up. So this is kind of interesting, right? Raptors need to migrate during the day. So that's what they're focused on during the fall. And then the songbirds are migrating at night, which is really good. So they're they're kind of missing each other, but they're all coming down at some point to feed, right? And the raptors will too as well. All right, let's play around with this a little bit. I'm gonna show you a slide. I'm gonna give you the silhouette. What do you think that one is? And you can type this in the chat. If we just went on silhouette, what do you think? We've got red tailed. Yeah, it's kind of split here. I see what you guys are doing. Yeah, red tailed and broad wing. So, one of the things I, and I, honest, totally honest here, every year I have to study my raptors over again, over and over and over again, so that I know what I'm seeing. Um, and it takes a lot of practice. The other thing that's really great is when you do attend um, migration at one of these sites for all of the raptors, it's great because then you get multiple raptors together in flight and you can start comparing them, which is really nice. We don't have another bird to compare this with. I think both of these guesses are good. Broad wing or red tailed. We would then probably go to the, the plumage on this bird and this is, this is broad winged hawk. Good job. But as you can see from the silhouette, they both look really very much alike. Okay, how about this one? And this one I'm gonna tell you is not on the silhouette sheet. But it's a very similar one. And this one's tipped a little bit. So we're maybe not getting that perfect flat. What do you think this one might be? Good, good, good. And if you know me, you know that I think if we could say it's a hawk, awesome. And if we're enjoying it, we're like, yes, it looks fabulous in the sunshine. How much can I notice, right? Good, Bab says sharp shinder coopers. Yeah, 
And that's where I would put that. We've got this long tail in relation to the length of the body, right? From the head, it comes out a little bit, but it's that long, narrow tail. Um, someone else was talking about falcon falcons we've got, and they're not always perfectly in that nice, like sharp, triangular shaped wing. But if you watch them for a while, they will fold into that nice kind of triangular shape that we see here. That's really good. They have that long tail too, long, narrow tail. Good, good, good. This is so much fun to play around with because when you get to a situation like this, you're like, I don't know. This is from Hawk Mountain down in Pennsylvania where everything just like, it looks like someone just threw like little tiny pepper flakes up in the air and you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know what any of those are, but I'm lying down. I'm relaxed. I'm enjoying the day. It's amazing. This is the other reason why I really like um, hawk watching so much because this is like a great way to lay back and enjoy what you're viewing. Um, for those of you who are from Vermont, um, this is uh, this is Brian Pfeiffer. If you know, and you guys might know him from the Southern Adirondacks too. Brian Pfeiffer was one of my mentors, um, took me out a lot as I started birding, um, really got me focused on how to look and, and how to laugh and have a good time. Um, I just, yeah. Anyways, funny shout out Brian while we birded together way back in the day. All right, let's move on to waterfowl. I love waterfowl. You know why? Because they, they're big <laughs> and they float on the water. They're not these tiny little warblers moving all around. Um, and I found them pretty challenging to get um, down as well. And I just, I love the opportunity to go and look because of the feathers and the, the it's almost like it's a texture, but it's not quite the patterns and the colors and the way that they are arranged really beautifully. I will give you this one tip to waterfowl. Um, one of the things that helped me and like really sped me on my way to being able to clinch IDs um, was uh, Cornell's approach to looking at where the white is on the bird and the unchanging characteristics like the silhouette. So think of the bird in silhouette, point out where the white is and that's what's gonna help you clinch an ID here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, when these guys move. So let's see, I'm thinking October through the beginning of December here, um, we've got loons starting to move as well during this time of year. And um, gosh, in our region, we love the snow geese um, that are like mid October through November. So it's really nice how everything plays out, right? We've got, you know, late summer into early fall with the, um, with the warblers and then hawks come in in September. And then as we move into October, we get to enjoy waterfowl and bundling up for waterfowl. That's for sure too. So the waterfowl flyways are a little bit different than um, what we saw for our songbirds, those aerial flyways. So we have four, we have the Atlantic, the Mississippi, the Central and the Pacific. And they do tend to be like, we see these thick bands of where those birds tend to be moving um, through. So a little bit different than um, what we know of songbirds. And for the most part, um, these birds, um, well, that's not true either, because some birds migrate, the loons migrate during the day and um, other waterfowl will be migrating um, at night. We have beautiful birds like these hooded mergansers, which are going to move out to coastal areas. So we have we have the north south movement, but then we also have like uh, west east movement here on the coast from inland lakes out to coastal waters. So we have different birds doing that, like our hooded mergansers, and then the common loons do that as well. So you'll start to see um, those birds kind of gathering, right? Where loons are so territorial during the summer, we get these groups of loons that are kind of staging together and then moving on and leaving the lakes here to go to um, the shore, the ocean. Oh my gosh, where you can then get into all those sea ducks and things, that's worth a winter trip. 
One of the things that I love to watch, and somebody mentioned this, right? We were talking about whether those geese, what what was up with the geese, and um, Sue Elliott talked about how those the geese that were confused that I'm scrolling back um, that Zoe saw could be um, Brant as well. Um, Zoe was talking about the formation and how they weren't in their typical V-shaped formation. Um, you know, I didn't do very well in physics in high school, but if they had maybe used birds or nature or something, maybe I would have done better because this type of physics is really interesting to me. So when waterfowl like geese and ducks or our snow geese line up, what they're really doing is exploiting turbulence to make these long migratory flights possible um, in that V formation. So all the geese in the flock, except for the leader, right, are lifted by what we call a verticular updraft from the wing beats of the bird in the front. So except for the leader, everybody in the back is helping the next bird behind them. And what researchers calculate is that a V formation of 25 birds avoids 65% of the drag that an individual bird would battle. And so it boosts their range by a total of 75%. That's pretty incredible. So talking about teamwork in order to help them get where they're going. And we've watched this, right? We've watched the trade-off between the leader and the next bird behind them so that that bird can take a break and take advantage of that upwash and those verticular updrafts that the birds are creating um, in front of them. How, so Jim asked, how far do loons go? I guess it all depends on where they start and where, um, they end up. Um, right. So I think that's going to differ for different populations. That's a really great question, right? I think of some of the loons from the Great Lakes, where are they going to go? All right, snow geese, oh my gosh. Okay, so how about snow geese for you guys? I'm really curious on your side of the lake, right? So here, um, Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area used to be a really great hotspot for snow geese in the tens of thousands. Some of the farming practices have changed. So we're seeing a shift in where those birds stage during the day and take breaks. So we don't have as many of them at Dead Creek. I've actually had a lot of luck with them on um, the New York side of the lake up near where I am. So coming down and around and seeing now, I can't remember any of the names of the state parks. Um, maybe some of my friends that are here from Vermont can help me. But basically what I do is I just go around the northern end of the lake and then just drive all the lake routes all the way down um, to where um, there's these, what is it? Is it King King Bay? I think it's King Bay. There's just a huge bay where you can pick up maybe two to 5,000 of the snow geese. Anybody in the chat about snow geese near you? Any of my friends seen them in Vermont yet? I haven't picked up on any um, snow geese in Vermont yet. I've seen, John says, I've seen huge flocks stage once every couple of years on Saratoga Lake. Yep. It's really super fun. I think it's super fun. I understand the residents of some of these areas don't like them because they're really loud and raucous. And then um, they're really messy as well. And so um, they, the neighbors and some of the places where I would take clients to go see the snow geese, they would take turns going out on kayaks or boats to try to scare them off of the water near their homes. So for some of us, we were really excited to see them there and others, not so much. Annette says, I've seen snow geese high on the wing over Hudson in, over the Hudson in Fort Edward. Okay, awesome, thank you. See, and those birds, are still coming. So we'll still have a chance to see them. All right. How did we get all this knowledge about birds? Well, it's taken right time and years and years of different studies and the technology has really come a long way. And at the same time, it's really amazing how much we don't know yet. We haven't quite figured it out. 
Um, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies has done some really great work. I'm going to kind of share two studies here. So this is Bicknell's thrush that breeds on um, mountaintops in uh, the Northeast. You could see from the map here, those green dots are the known breeding areas. So what's really challenging for this bird is they have a very small um, breeding range and habitat type, right? They're very habitat specific. And then it's the same thing on the wintering ground. So if you look at the bottom of that map, you can see the little maroon areas um, in the Dominican Republic and Hispaniola where their known wintering areas are. And the orange is the probable spring migration route, right? They're gonna come, they're gonna come across those islands and then up to Florida. That's a shorter distance, right? And then come up the coastline and then look at what they do during the winter time, during this fall migration period. They're gonna come down the coastline and then out over the water and down to those islands there onto their wintering grounds. So a lot of challenges involved in that. What the Vermont Center for Eco Studies has done in order to understand these flyways for this bird is put these little backpacks with microchips on them that send um, data to computers that they can then get these data points to understand how the birds are moving. That allows us to better plan for conservation efforts to help the birds along that route and then also be prepared for them when they arrive at their wintering grounds or their breeding grounds to protect that land. The other study that um, VCE is known for is on the black pole warbler, that little tiny like false chickadee bird. Um, and here what you're seeing are a set of one, two, three, four, five maps of five different individual birds, so, or sorry, four, four warblers, A, B, C, D, and there's E on here too, but that's not what my notes say. Um, and so these are birds that they were able to put transmitters on. And you can see that it tracks both their spring um, migration route, right, over to Florida. You can see how some of those birds are doing that. And then, um, and then out over the water, this is the thing that I think is crazy, that they go out over the water um, to head uh, south for the winter. So... Let me grab my notes here. So they have, they've been fitted with little miniature devices that are called light level geolocators, which are like little songbird backpacks, basically. The warblers um, left in the fall and then spent the winter in the tropics and then returned in the spring to their breeding sites where they, they were able to recapture five birds and remove the geolocators and got basically their flight itinerary. So their flight times, what I find really interesting here is that their flight times ranged from 49 hours, 49 hours to 73 hours. And the flights were roughly, all roughly around 1600 miles. So the fifth bird, which was also first captured in Vermont, likely took a shorter transoceanic trip. So that's this bird E, um, which was really kind of interested interesting and it left the mainland from Cape Hatteras and then flew nearly a thousand miles nonstop for 18 hours and then landed in the Turks and Caicos before continuing on to South America. So it's pretty incredible these birds, um, so they're not done yet, right? Like this is the other thing, right? You are only seeing a little bit of the map, like we're catching the part where they're flying over the ocean. Um, back to their breeding grounds. But what's crazy is after arriving in Hispaniola or Puerto Rico for a break, the birds have continued to fly on to Northern Colombia and Venezuela. So this is like for a total of close to 3000 miles. It's insane that we even have this bird on the landscape when you think about them doing this twice a year. It's pretty incredible. So there's lots that we can do, right? We think about this absolutely incredible journey that so many of these birds are making. And we're like, how, how can I do something to help these birds? So this is a lovely illustration um, that came from Megan 
um, Gen Cal. And she kind of like mapped out, like drew this beautiful visual about what it's like to be an American Red Start throughout the year and what they're doing during different times of year. And also some of the important things to keep in mind that we can do to help them. So breeding habitat quality influences re reproductive success. So these birds are breeding here. How can we keep forests in the best quality in the best shape in order to help those birds be successful? And there are a number of great programs out there to help us um, figure out as landowners what we can do when we're managing our forests for these birds from both New York Audubon and Audubon Vermont. I think it's really incredible that New York and Audubon have both been leaders in um, helping landowners manage their land in a way that's good for songbirds. During migration, stopover sites um, are really important for birds to be able to fuel up and rest. Those of us who have small backyards, right? Like me, I live in St. Albans City. I can make sure I'm planting native plants in my yard that will help them when they stop over. We're gonna talk about qu uh, quality wintering habitat, which is really super important. And then threats to birds along the way, things like keeping your lights out at night is very important. Um, working on decreasing window strikes, we can put little grid patterns on our windows so that the um, reflective quality of that window is broke up. It doesn't look like continuing habitat for them. And um, we can use BirdCast to actually help advocate in our communities um, when we should be putting things in place to help decrease window strikes and um, birds being trapped by city lights. So there are a number of cities across the country that are doing a lights out campaign during the migratory um, season to help some of these birds. Here's a couple other things to think about as well. When we think about traditional conservation, I think we have to start to think broader um, big picture management is one of the things that I have on here where we can start to, I know in Vermont, Audubon Vermont has this great program where they're working with landowners that live in a, a, a community, a town together, so that landowners are working in conjunction with other landowners. There's another great program through Cold Hollow to Canada that does this so that we're not thinking in our own little bubble. We're actually kind of thinking across all of our um, our owned properties, our own parcels of land. We also have to start to think of forests as infrastructure and other habitats as infrastructure. So in our community planning, how do we look at intact forests or intact wetlands or even grasslands as part of our infrastructure that will help protect biodiversity? That's really super important. Another thing that's really coming into play that I love and I will talk about during um, the um, herstory of birding talk that I will be um, giving for you guys in March um, is really thinking about how um, different animals sometimes select habitat based on their sex. So if we keep sex specific habitat selection in mind, when we're trying to conserve land for birds, this can really help protect breeding populations of birds. So for example, um, uh, Bicknell's, I think it's Bicknell's thrush, uh, anyway, oh, I'm not sure now. Let's see. It's either Bicknell's thrush or, oh, 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 is it black poles? So some birds, I'll put it this way, some birds, and when they arrive on their wintering grounds, the males um, uh, occupy one habitat type and the females occupy another habitat. It is Bicknell's thrush. The males are up higher elevation and the females are at lower elevation. So if we only work to protect forests that those birds are using in lower elevations, we're leaving out the ones that are in higher elevations. And oftentimes we tend to focus on the male birds in our research. And so we are just coming to begin to understand that there is this habitat selection that is different for female birds of some species. So we need to keep doing that research so we can better understand how to protect the land for them. 
um, protect unfragmented forests and other habitats. Let's keep things contiguous and linked together. We can even do this in our communities um, by making our yards linked together by the type of plants and trees and shrubs that we allow to exist there. And then continue to work on planning for climate change. How can we help our forests and our habitats become more resilient in the face of climate change? And what does that look like for each different habitat? All right, I think I've given you a lot to think about, at least I hope I have. I am gonna show you how you can reach out and get in touch with me if you have any questions that come up afterwards. My website is birddiva.com. I am at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'm kind of all over the place. And um, I would love you to explore slow birding with me. It is my signature program and I teach online courses as well as in-person workshops. Once things open up a little bit more from COVID, we can get together and slow bird together. And I think a lot of the things that we talked about tonight are really great things to slow down and notice during the fall. So they, they cause us to pause and take time out. And so I hope you will do that this fall and enjoy some of these different birds that are moving through and then get ready for winter excitement and all those winter birds that are gonna come online as well. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, really awesome. Uh, my dad uh, immigrated from uh, Germany, so I've got German in me. So those German oh. words. <laughs> So did I say it right? That's the other thing. Do you, how do you, do you know how to pronounce that? No, I think you got it just right. Okay, I, good. Yeah, um, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. So, but from what it sounds like, you you got it right. <laughs> nice. So I noticed you put in here woods, wildlife, and warblers, the collaborative project between Audubon, Vermont. And, and a bunch of other partners, including New York Forest Owners Association and the New York Tree Farm Program. Um, can you mention that a little bit more? Uh, I Well, I, what I, I, I don't know it m too much in detail other than uh, the, uh, I, I think his name is Zach uh, from Audubon, New York, out of Albany. He's um, head of uh, this program who will um, visit uh, a forest owner's property and assess it and uh, work with the landowner to see how they can make it more bird friendly basically and how to sustainably manage the forest um, if, if they want to go that route if they want to harvest yeah. portions of it and then leave understory and mm -hmm. just keep it uh, so uh, anybody interested in that can reach out to me and I can connect you with uh, that gentleman who does that who can visit your property who can enlighten you more on how great uh, they do that so I, I did do a workshop uh with an, uh, over the summertime uh early spring actually so i got to see three different levels of forest uh management basically uh, mm -hmm. to see how they managed it for birds so i, I got to see it but i'm not that guy who does it <laughs> yeah that's great yeah okay so we got other questions rolling in here let's see so annette says um where do our bluebirds go in the winter so i have had experiences with bluebirds in the winter time i'm sure some of the rest of you have as well so they are going to respond to a couple different things like food availability but then also how much snow there is on the ground and i know here in vermont where i go to look for them is in the champlain valley right so um, windblown, there's a little bit more food resources still available um, to them there. So we do still have bluebirds during the winter time. eBird is a great resource to look up some of these birds and see if they are still present. They have these um, 
oh, what are they called? Histograms. So for each individual bird, it's this really cool little like rectangular graph setup with um, each of the four weeks popped out and you'll get green bands in those weeks if people are um, finding them on the landscape near you. And so it's a great way to track which birds are still around when they are leaving, when they're arriving back, and if they pop up during the winter time. That's a great question, Annette. It's really kind of fun to go and find those. All right, Barbara says, suggest which plants are the top ones to try to have in Saratoga County to help birds. Okay, so I'm pretty sure this is fairly the same because we're in the same kind of eco region when it comes right down to it. But my top two favorites are viburnums and dogwoods. And you want to make sure that um, you, you've got native ones. Now, Audubon has a great program online where you can literally type in your zip code and it will pump out a list for you. So if you go to the National Audubon website and I, there's a, there's a, it's a plant-based program. I can't remember the name of it. Maybe someone can put it in the chat because I know somebody here is probably got it right on the tip of their tongue. Unlike, <laughs> unlike me tonight. <laughs> there we go. Good. So just pop your, you put your zip code in there. So the ones I mentioned tonight were dogwood viburnum, winterberry. So berries that are winter persistent are really important. Um, which means they hold their berries through the winter and they're not going to um, decay. They might get um, a little bit of alcohol content in there, which is why we sometimes see drunk wax wings and things like that, because the freeze thaw ferments the berry. And then there's a little bit of alcohol in there after that. So John's sipping cider. I wonder if John is sipping hard cider. It's kind of like that same thing, right? hard cranberries or hard uh, crab apples versus soft crab apples. Um, let's see. Allison, great question. Did this warm fall affect the timing of migration for any birds? The hummingbird stayed a couple of weeks past Labor Day this fall. So it sounds like you track what the birds are doing in your um, yard. And that's great. Um, the other resource that's doing that live every day is eBird. And so we can actually look at some of those trends. There's a great um, graph making feature on there where you can do that. You can pull up um, the bird that you're interested in and you can um, plug it into the graph. You can narrow down um, like the years and the, the months when you wanna see the presence of that bird in people's eBird reports and get a good idea of um, how weather this year has been affecting birds. I mean, that's one of the most amazing things about eBird is you can get real time, like just last week kind of data and pull that right out. Oh, you guys are all so kind. Thank you. Yes, I'm really glad I got to hang out with you guys tonight. Let's see, Bab says, I saw them last winter. She must be talking about bluebirds, I think, in Wheeler Park in South Burlington in Addison County. Any fun sites to share with my elementary school students where I work to educate them about migration? You know, I, and I've said it, right? I'm like Audubon and Cornell, Audubon and Cornell. So Cornell has um, really great resources for educators on their website. And I'm sure they have something specific to migration. The BirdCast website is so much fun to go and play around with. And I'm sure kids would love that as well. So try Cornell Lab of Ornithology for that um, kind of stuff. Diane, partridge berry have berries through the winter. They're very bland tasting to us, but they might be great to partridge um, and even woodpeckers, right? Coming down on the ground. I've seen woodpeckers eat um, sumac in the wintertime too. Jason says, is there anything we should change about feeder contents or layout in this fall and spring to help those journeying birds? That's really interesting. I never really thought about shifting what I, well, like, yeah, you could shift what you provide, right? I know people that feed bluebirds mealworms in little trays through the winter time. That can be super helpful. Um, I think anything that's got um, fats in it, right? Like the, the, the nut blends are really good. Um, I think 
Um, and probably there are different types of suet that will help as well. So someone was mentioning a palm warbler sticking around and I was joking around if it was at a bird feeding station because warblers have been known during this time of year to drop in at bird feeder stations um, to eat suet and sometimes seed as well. Water, water is awesome. I got myself a heated bird bath last year during the winter time. That was amazing. Okay. Oh my gosh, so many good things in the chat, right? Everybody's sharing their knowledge. This is great. Annette, summer elderberries and wild grapevines. John's got the plants for birds thing in there. Boom, go team bird. We got all the questions. Any last burning questions? And if you have one that you can't remember, right? You can just, just reach out to me. I'm gonna stick my website in here again. Just type bird diva in. As far as I know, there's only one of me, which is good. It's good for business that way, for sure. <laughs> there is the bird chick in Minnesota, by the way. We have not met yet. Oh, my. I, I, wonder I think <laughs> someone's got to coordinate that, right? Yes. <laughs> I would like to meet her. And the for bird sure. demon need to meet. I'm just going to say thank you to everyone. Thanks to the library, Chris, um, for hosting tonight and pulling all of this together. And I cannot wait to visit you online again soon in 2022. Absolutely. And the, the, the reason why we, you know, Vermont and the Southern, Southern Adirondacks, we are much, we have so much in common with our boreal habitats, our forests, our upland grasslands, uh, in our, in our latitudes. So that's why, you know, everything that you share, and especially the maps that you share, connect our, both of our states and the geography and the habitats of our birds and our states. So quite relevant. Can't wait to have you back in March and then in May. So let's make this happen again. Uh, thank you again, Bridget, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Great program. Bye. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.